Every year, over 12 million hectares of land turn into desert. Land that once grew food, now useless. That's the size of Pennsylvania, gone annually. What if I told you wheat is now being grown in the middle of the desert, without any soil, and outproducing traditional farmland? In a country where over 90% of the land is desert, and wheat imports top $5 billion a year, this approach is turning one of the world's harshest landscapes into something truly radical, productive. Today we're diving into how it works, why it works, and what it could mean for farming, especially in regions where soil is poor, water is limited. Why Egypt? Why sand? Egypt is the world's largest importer of wheat. The country consumes over 20 million metric tons annually, but domestic production supplies barely half of that. With a fast-growing population, set to hit 160 million by 2050, and limited arable land, food security has become a matter of national strategy. Over 96% of Egypt's land mass is desert, yet for decades the government has pursued an ambitious goal – reclaim that desert. Millions of acres in regions like Toshka and North Sinai have been opened up to agriculture, but it's never been easy. The challenge is obvious – sand isn't soil. It lacks structure, nutrients, and the microbial life plants need to thrive. It drains too fast, and it holds nothing. Traditional wisdom says sand is a dead medium. But instead of fighting that, Egypt's researchers flipped the script. What if you didn't try to make sand act like soil? What if you treated it as a blank slate and built a living system on top of it from scratch? That's the foundation of the Sahara Wheat Project, and it's what we'll explore next. The Breakthrough Wheat in Pure Sand In 2021, Egypt's Agricultural Research Center launched field experiments in North Sinai and Toshka, planting wheat directly into pure, washed desert sand, no clay, no compost base, no added topsoil. Instead of amending the sand to mimic loam, they used targeted biological and water inputs, compost teas to introduce beneficial microbes, mycorrhizal inoculants to assist nutrient uptake, precision drip irrigation to minimize evaporation, seed priming, and heat-tolerant wheat varieties bred specifically for desert heat. What happened next turned heads. These sand-grown wheat fields yielded up to 3.8 tons per hectare, nearly double the national average of conventional, soil-grown wheat in Egypt, around 2.1 tons ha. Not only did the crops thrive, but researchers observed reduced fungal pressure, fewer weeds, and near-zero root diseases, despite the complete absence of traditional soil. In other words, sand wasn't the limitation, it was the opportunity. Why it works at first glance, growing wheat in sand seems counterintuitive. But dig a little deeper and the logic becomes clear. Drainage is your friend. Sand drains quickly, which eliminates standing water and reduces root rot, a common problem in heavy compacted soils. Compaction is non-existent. Wheat roots spread easily through loose sand, building a dense root system that anchors the plant and absorbs nutrients efficiently. With no crusting, there's better germination and root oxygenation. Biology is reintroduced, not relied on. Instead of assuming fertility, farmers inoculate the sand with microbial life, fungi, bacteria, and compost tea microbes that actively build a micro-ecosystem around each root zone. It's like creating soil from scratch, only exactly where it's needed. Fewer pests and diseases. The dry, isolated desert environment drastically reduces pressure from fungal pathogens and soil-borne pests. Fewer inputs are needed, and crops respond with better vigor. Irrigation is lean but effective. Drip lines target the root zone directly, which means less water use and minimal nutrient leaching. With solar pumps and careful timing, even resource-scarce farms can thrive. In short, the system works not because it mimics soil, but because it doesn't try to. It creates a new growing environment entirely, engineered from the ground up to be efficient, productive, and resilient. Regenerative twist. Can this be replicated elsewhere? This isn't just a fluke that works in Egypt, it's a blueprint. Globally, over 900 million hectares are classified as arid or semi-arid, according to the FAO. Much of it sits idle, not because it can't grow food, but because traditional methods fail there. But what if desert sand isn't a dead zone but an untapped resource? In the U.S. Southwest, abandoned agricultural zones in Arizona and New Mexico suffer from salinized soil and water stress but they still have sand, sun, and access to drip technology. In Australia's outback, low-input farms are already experimenting with closed-loop compost tea systems to rehabilitate barren land. 
Imagine introducing bioactive microbes into inert sand and tailoring irrigation precisely, just like in Egypt. The innovation is also catching attention in northern Mexico, where water rights are tight and degraded land is pushing farmers to experiment. Add to that solar-powered pumps and biological amendments, and you're looking at a decentralized, scalable solution that doesn't depend on large infrastructure. And here's the kicker. This isn't just extractive. With the right rotation, legumes, root crops, even silvopasture on the perimeters, a regenerative system could be built entirely on marginal land. One that builds life from sand, not in spite of it. Risks, drawbacks, and long-term viability. Of course, it's not all upside. The most pressing concern? Salinity. As water evaporates in desert conditions, salts accumulate at the surface. Without active leaching or biological mitigation, this can render sand sterile over time, especially if municipal or brackish water is used for irrigation. Second, the fertility in sand isn't self-renewing. Unlike rich loam, there's no natural humus or microbial community to rebound after harvest. That means constant inputs, not just nutrients, but biology. Compost teas, microbial inoculants, and even cover crop residues need to be replenished consistently to avoid collapse. There's also the matter of water dependency. This system only works if irrigation is precise, reliable, and affordable. In areas where water tables are falling or aquifers are already overdrawn, scalability becomes questionable unless paired with solar desalination, gray water reuse, or rainwater harvesting systems. And finally, this model takes effort to establish. While it's low maintenance once running, the early phase requires infrastructure, drip lines, pumps, fertigation tools, biological prep. So is it a magic bullet? No. But in areas with abundant sun, cheap land, and limited soil, it may be one of the most viable paths forward especially as weather extremes push conventional farmland to the edge. Farmer takeaways. What can we apply now? You don't have to be farming in a desert to learn from this. For anyone working degraded or sandy soils, think parts of Florida, the Carolinas, Central Texas. This system offers real, replicable strategies. First, inoculate before you irrigate. Sand has no biology of its own, so microbes are the engine. Compost teas and microbial inoculants aren't just organic fluff. They're the difference between sterile and productive. Second, drip is king. Overhead irrigation in sandy soils just drains through. But targeting water at the root zone, especially with fertigation, builds a micro-ecosystem around each plant. Third, think in layers. Don't just plant wheat. Intercrop with legumes that fix nitrogen. Use crops with deep roots to stabilize the profile. Even in a small homestead garden, layering builds long-term fertility. And yes, this applies to raised beds too. Got poor subsoil? Try a sand-heavy mix with microbial inputs and tight irrigation control. It's not magic, but it's biologically intelligent design. The big message, stop assuming marginal land is wasted. It's not about forcing it to look like Iowa. It's about working with what's there, then hacking the biology to build function over time. Egypt's wheat project didn't start with perfect soil. It started with a question. What if we could grow food where no one thought we could? And they did. Not just barely, but at double the national yield, with fewer pests, less runoff, and a system that's getting smarter each season. The real takeaway? Regeneration isn't about returning to some past ideal. It's about reimagining what's possible. If we can grow wheat in sand using biology, precision, and a little imagination. What else can we do with the land we've written off? Have you tried anything like this? Bio-intensive beds, sand-based systems, unconventional amendments? Let us know in the comments. Your experiment might be the next big shift. And if you know someone farming in tough conditions, send them this. We need more people thinking beyond the plow.